Welcome to Renegade Inc, the talk show which allows us to think differently. Every war has unintended consequences which are often catastrophic, but we live at a time when we allow our political leaders to continue to wage war on formless, often unbeatable enemies. As soon as the word war is used, it creates a binary outcome, us versus them, one side being the self-appointed good guys painting the enemy as the evil wrongdoers. But this muscular language clouds the subtlety of the underlying social and human issues. It also means that one side must win at all costs. The war on drugs is the new 100-year war and isn't ending anytime soon. So isn't it now time that we readdress this challenge by using different language, different laws and different leadership? Or is the war on drugs so entrenched that vested interests and the authorities are blind to reframing? If you think the war on terror is an expensive exercise, everything about it pales into insignificance when we talk about the bigger war on our doorstep, the so-called war on drugs. More than a century of conflict, confiscation, court cases and incarceration later, and there's still no end in sight. Joining me to discuss this failed conflict and how to rectify it are the writer and author of Chasing the Screen, Johan Hari, and the former undercover police officer turned drug campaigner and writer of the book Good Cop, Bad War, Neil Woods. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming by. Well, good to be back. When we look at the war on drugs, there is absolutely no end in sight. When you've looked at it a lot, why, why is it so fiendishly difficult to defeat? Well, I think it's based on a series of really mistaken premises. And because it's misdiagnosing the problem, it's getting the wrong solutions. I actually think Neil's book, uh, I'm, I'm in a slightly awkward situation here because I'm more inclined to just sit and listen to Neil. He's written a fantastic book about this and has been so brave and so brilliant on this issue and is doing so much good. But what I found in the... You know, I've been researching this for God six years now and I've been to about 17 different countries and I've really been to the places that have tried the most brutal possible war on drugs. You know, in Arizona, I went out with a women, group of women who were made to go out on chain gangs wearing T-shirts saying I was a drug addict and forced to dig graves while members of the public mock them. I've been to Vietnam where, uh, you know, people, are, drug addicts are forced into gulags, forced labour camps for years on end. And I've been to the places that adopt the most compassionate and most sensible possible drug policies. Where are they? Portugal has decriminalised all drugs with incredible results. Switzerland has legalised heroin. Colorado, Washington and Uruguay have legalised cannabis. I can talk about the results. And the main thing I saw is everywhere the results were the same. Brutal policies based on shame, stigma and repression lead to bigger addiction crises, much more dangerous drug use and catastrophic waves of violence for reasons we can talk about. And places where they've adopted compassionate, sensible, regulation-based policies. It's not a magic bullet, they still have problems. But the problems with addiction really significantly fall. Uh, the problems associated with drug use really significantly fall. And if you legalise, you can have a massive fall in violence. So I think at some point, at the moment, countries like the US and Britain are following the places that have catastrophically failed. One of the reasons I cared about this subject, and you and I have talked about this before, is because we had drug addiction in, in my family. One of my earliest memories is of trying to wake up one of my relatives and, and not being able to, and I didn't understand why, but as I got older, I obviously understood. And I, one of the things that most strikes me about the drug war debate is how many of the basic ideas, including ideas that I had, are mistaken. So if we think about addiction, right? So the war on drugs, premise of the war on drugs when it comes to addiction, there are many aspects of it, but one of the public justifications is that this will reduce addiction. It's based on the idea if we punish people with addiction problems, they'll be, it will teach them a lesson, teach them a lesson in inverted commas, and they'll uh, be less likely to want to continue to use drugs. And I think you have to look at some of the, the, the premises that under, underlie that. So if you think about, um, if you had said to me five years ago, what causes heroin addiction? I would have looked at you like you were thick, and I would have said, well, it's called heroin addiction for a reason, right? It's obviously caused by heroin. And would you have attributed that to a personal failing on the... Um, on the I wouldn't attribute it to a personal failing so much, but what I would have done is attributed it to chemical hooks within the drug. Right. So we think that if, you know, we're in a studio in, um, in West London, if we kidnapped, um, you know, 20 people off the street and we forcibly injected them all with heroin every day for a month, at the end of that month, they'd all be heroin addicts for a simple reason that there are chemical hooks in heroin that their bodies would start to desperately physically need. Does that happen? Well, this is the thing that really shocked me. The first thing that led to me is about something wrong with that story is when it's explained to me. Here in Britain, if any of us walk out of this interview and we get hit by, you or me get hit by a truck, 
God forbid, um, and we're taking, say you break your hip and you'll be, you'll be taken to hospital, you'll be given lots of a drug called diamorphine for the pain. Diamorphine is heroin. It's just the medical name for heroin, right? It's much better heroin than you're going to get from the guys that Neil used to uh, be busting as, uh, as an undercover cop because right. it's medically pure, right? If what we think about addiction is right, what should be happening to all these people who are being, being given diamorphine in hospital? Some of them should be becoming addicts. This has been studied very carefully. It, it virtually never happens. Why? And well, the, this, the question I ask myself, right, is that this is so weird. I didn't, frankly didn't believe it. I kept looking at the scientific evidence. It's very clear. And I only really began to understand it when I went to Vancouver. I spent a lot of time in Vancouver and got to know an incredible man called Bruce Alexander, who's a professor of psychology. And Professor Alexander explained to me this, this theory we have about chemical hooks. So we've got to you know, punish the addicts and we've got to get rid of the drugs because they'll take people over. Uh, comes from a series of experiments that were done earlier in the 20th century. They're, they're really simple experiments. We could do them in the studio if we were feeling a bit uh, sadistic. You take a rat and you put it in a cage and you give it two water bottles. One is just water and the other is water laced with either heroin or cocaine. If you do that, the rat will almost always prefer the drugged water and almost always kill itself. So there you go, that's, that's our story, right? But that's an open and shut case. That, that's what they thought. Is that, the, is that true? Well, in the 70s, Professor Alexander came along and looked at these experiments and said, well, hang on a minute. We put the rat alone in an empty cage where it's got nothing to do except use these drugs. Let's do this differently. So he built a cage that he called Rat Park, which is basically like heaven for rats, right? They've got loads of cheese, they can have loads of sex, they've got coloured balls, which apparently rats love. And, uh, and they perfect. Exactly, coloured balls, what more could you want? <laughs> and they've got uh, both the water bottles, the normal water, and the drugged water. But this is the fascinating thing. In Rat Park, they don't like the drugged water. They almost never use it. None of them ever use it compulsively. None of them ever overdose. Now, there's a, a lot of human examples I can give if you want, but what this tells us is when they have bad lives where they have nothing that gives their life meaning, they, they will be very likely to compulsively use drugs. When they have good lives, they're extremely unlikely to compulsively use drugs. The opposite of addiction is not sobriety, the opposite of addiction is connection. And in case this sounds, you know, a little bit esoteric, like, okay, you're talking about rats, there are places that built their human drug policies around these insights with incredible results. When you hear this, Neil, um about environment, context, human beings and context. How much of it, um, from what you saw as an undercover officer and dealing with the drug dealers and, and users, um, puts a light on and you think, yeah, actually, I can see that connection. Poor environment, poor context does equal drug abuse, drug use. Absolutely. I mean, what I used to do is manipulate problematic heroin users. They, they would be my sort of starting point for an operation to get them to introduce me to gangsters. And how would you do that? Well, I would get to, I would pose as one of them. I would uh, use empathy and just find out about their story. And, you know, if they trust you, pe people will quite often tell you all about their lives. And time and time again, I was finding that people were using heroin because they couldn't cope with the memories of their lives without using it. I'll give you an example. It's a young lady in Northampton. She went by the street name of Uma. And she told me one day, I could do my rattle. I could come off heroin, and I do sometimes. And a rattle is just a... Rattle is coming, it's deciding to stop taking it and go through the withdrawal and stop taking it. And she says, yeah, I do sometimes. But I tend not to because when I'm off heroin, I get suicidal because I remember the child abuse. I remember that uncle of mine and what he did to me as a child. So I choose to stay on heroin because it's a very pow powerful painkiller of the body, but it's also a very powerful painkiller of the mind. And... I don't know how many problematic heroin users I've met, but it's, it's a lot. It's, it's a lot that I've spent a great deal of time with and earned the trust of. And I would say the majority of them were self-medicating for some kind of trauma which happened to them as a child. They either neglect through uh, alcoholic parents, and there are actually some academic studies which back, up, back that up, that there is a, a, a close link between alcoholic parents and, and heroin use, problematic heroin use or physical or sexual abuse as children. That's such a common theme. And they were, they were disconnecting themselves from the world. They were, they were numbing themselves to that kind of trauma. And in Uma's case, deciding to do that was actually keeping her alive. Yeah, that was, that's the pragmatic decision yes. to numb her own mind, to, to, to protect herself.
Marianne Faithful, the singer, in her autobiography, is a great line where she, she, she had a period of homelessness and, and heroin addiction, and she says, heroin saved my life, because if it wasn't for heroin, I would have killed myself. Mm. And I know when Neil and I talk about this, a lot of people think, oh, okay, well, so that's people who are in, you know, extreme poverty, but they think about, well, you know, some of the people who were nice about my book, and I'm sure would be nice about Neil's, like people like Elton John or Russell Brand, who were not homeless street addicts when they had very serious addiction problems. And I think the, the key to understand it is the core of addiction is about trying not to be present in your life because your life is too painful a place to be. When we start to talk about this war on drugs, how much of this sensitivity amongst the users is taken into consideration as we sit here today? How much, how much from um, the powers that be who are trying to win this war do we say, actually, Neil, Jan, you've got a point here. We've got to treat these people differently as opposed to this enemy that we see. Well, I mean, there is lip service to it. From within the organisation that I worked and the investigating team that I worked with, there would be a suggestion that these, kind of pe these people that I was manipulating should be not treated as harshly by the courts. And so often I was, I was actually reassured with the idea that people should go just receive a drug testing order or something like that. But the reality is that any kind of court order will always be breached by those people who don't have the, the, the means to, to, to do it. And they will always end up in prison, which is just compounding trauma on top of trauma. It's literally the worst thing you can do to someone like that. Mm -hmm. So no, the, the system is just eating these people and chewing them up. And whereas you have the police on one side ramping up police tactics and trying harder to catch the dealers, uh, and the dealers defending themselves with intimidation, the people at court in the middle are those, those people that really need help. There are places that have tried the exact opposite of this approach. So I can give you a couple of examples if you want. In the year 2000, Portugal had one of the worst drug problems in Europe. 1% of the population was addicted to heroin, which is an extraordinary thing when you think about it. Mm. And every year they tried, they arrested more people, they imprisoned more people, they shamed more people, and every year the problem got worse. And one day the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition got together and decided to do something really radical, something no one had done for 70 years since the drugs were first banned. They said, should we like talk to some scientists about the facts? Wow. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Not. So they set up this panel led by an amazing man I got to know called Dr. Hua Gulao. And they said, you guys go away, look at the best evidence, uh, figure out what would genuinely solve this problem and come back and we've agreed in advance that we'll do it. So just took it out of politics. So they went away, Dr. Gulao learned about Rat Park, all sorts of different things, came back and said, decriminalize all drugs from cannabis to crack, everything, the whole lot, but, and this is the crucial next step, take all the money we currently spend on screwing people up, on arresting them, imprisoning them, shaming them, all the stuff that Neil has documented so fantastically in his work, um, and all the money we waste and all of that cruelty we inflict, take all of that money and spend it instead on turning people's lives around. Biggest thing they did was a massive program of job creation for addicts. If you used to be a mechanic, they go to a garage and they say, if you employ this guy for a year, we'll pay half his wages. If you're creating jobs, you're getting the most vulnerable who have been excluded maybe since childhood because they've felt odd or different or other um, and, and then that problems stayed with them all their life. You're then bringing them into society and saying, don't worry, I've got your back. You too can live a normal life. Is that the case with these people? Do they need, is that something that they need? They need that hand at their back? That's absolutely what they need. I mean, the stigma becomes the biggest problem. It, people can take a fall, they can get into all sorts of difficulties dealing with all, whatever trauma or difficulties they have. And once they start moving in that sort of, that underworld, which I used to move around in, in inner cities, it's very difficult to get out of it. It, it becomes a sort of self-perpetuating culture. Until you break that cycle and start looking after a few people, then, then that you are stuck with that sort of subculture. The biggest moral issue about the war on drugs is a totally different thing which you, your work shows so powerfully. Which is? It's the violence caused by prohibition. I think this is often misunderstood. It's worth just explaining to people how it works. The best way to explain it I've found is, imagine if you and me walked out of here now and we decided to steal a bottle of vodka to put in these glasses, right? I don't know, I'm sure there's an off-license somewhere nearby. If we went in there and the guy running that shop caught us, uh, he'd call the police. So the and the police would come and take us away. So that, sh that guy doesn't need to be violent, he doesn't need to be intimidating, he's got the power of the law to uphold his property rights. Okay, now imagine we decide to steal, a, not vodka, but a bag of weed or a bag of cocaine. From right? a dealer somewhere. Exactly. He can't ring the police, right? Police are going to come, uh, and Neil's former colleagues are going to come and take, take him away. Um, he has to fight us. In fact, 
he has to establish his place in that neighbourhood through violence. Now, you don't want to be having a fight every day, so you want to establish a reputation for being so frightening that people aren't going to take you on. The, the war on drugs creates a war for drugs through that dynamic. If you want to know how much of that is due to prohibition, just ask yourself, where are the violent alcohol dealers today, right? Everyone knows who Al Capone was. Everyone was afraid of him. No one's frightened of the head of Smirnoff. No one's frightened of the head of Heineken. The head of Heineken doesn't send teenagers to go and kill the head of Smirnoff, right? More people are dying in the war on drugs by some calculations than are dying in Syria, right? Now, I don't know what we can do about Syria. We should certainly take refugees. There are certain things we should do. But we can end this violence, right? We can stop it. It's exactly where to leave the first half. Because oh, okay. in the second half, we're going to come up with those solutions. Welcome back to Renegade Inc., the show that allows us to think differently. Before we talk more with Johan Hari and Neil Woods about the futility of the war on drugs and how to reframe our approach, let's have a quick look at this week's Renegade Inc. Index. We start with uh, our favourite tweets. First up is from Jedi for Standing Rock. Uh, you know it's true, Woody Harrelson, hashtag end the drug war. Woody says if weed was never made illegal, there would be a lot more people with memories of hungry stone fathers instead of angry, drunk, abusive ones. Do you think he's right, I Neil? It, it's a clumsy comparison, but I don't disagree with the sentiment. Having, having dealt with a, an enormous amount of domestic violence victims in this country as a police officer, alcohol played such a massive part. And you know, as the, lots of police officers would agree with me, I've not met an aggressive cannabis user yet. Uh, the second up is from uh, uh, Anne Pettifer. She highlights a quote from the article, How Trump Could Get Fired. Uh, he doesn't drink, he doesn't do drugs. His drug is himself. Next up is from Altan Molly. Uh, can't get over this statistic from meta-analysis regarding loneliness and mortality. Loneliness is estimated to be as bad for people smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Do we agree with that? Well, John Cassiopo, Con who's a professor at the University of Chicago, has done this research, and it, yeah, it's unequivocally true. There's enormous research. Human beings need connection. We need social connection, we need connection to meaning and purpose. Back to Rat Park. And if you deprive us of it, our lives go catastrophically wrong. Which has a solitary confinement, has a whole new meaning, and why the hell would you do it? Especially? That's why it's the worst form of torture. When John McCain talked about the torture he received when he was in Vietnam, they broke his arms, they broke his legs, they did terrible things to him. He said the worst thing they ever did was just leave him in a room alone. Finally, on a much lighter note, uh, from Tar Australius, um, if you're happy and you know it... I don't understand. Am I being thick? Well... If you're happy, I am too. Then, okay, good. That makes me feel better. I love this. He it, was an actual undercover detective, and he can't and get he it. He can't figure this out. Fantastic. Right? If you're happy and you know it, clamp your ham. <laughs> Come on. I'm laughing on the inside. <laughs> no, it's fine. Yeah. Do you, if you're happy and you know it, clamp your hands. You know that. Yeah. This is someone who's gone out, clamped a ham, taken a picture of it, and put it on Twitter. This is not the form of drug activism that Neil and I advocate so strongly. It's fine. It's okay. I feel that Tara Solisis is not spending her life perhaps in the best way she could, but key, key, nonetheless, I wish her well. Key point. Okay. Our book of the week this week is Empathy by Roman Kaznari. It should be Neil's book. Uh, he says that <laughs> we... Roman's book. He <laughs> says... <laughs> he's, oh, well, we'll get through this. Okay, sorry. Uh, our book of the week this week is Empathy by Roman Kaznarik. He says that we are wired for empathy, claiming that it can create a revolution of human relationships. In an age of the individual, he argues that we need to switch on our empathic brains if we are to solve many of the world's ills. Empathic adventurers, as Kaznarik calls them, have understood that society is more willing to take collective action over others' suffering when they're no longer seen as others. But without empathy in the equation, nothing really changes at all. Now, when it comes to non-empathy and leaders who are strong and wrong uh, or feel that might is right, Filipino president and lawyer Rodrigo Duterte takes top spot in what is a very competitive international league table. After proudly allowing vigilantes to arbitrarily kill drug addicts at will, the 71-year-old who thinks he's winning the war on drugs released a Christmas message in 2016, and this is what he had to say. Alam ninyo, ako'y tao lamang. Kaya binabati ko pa rin. Merry Christmas. Kayo mga drogista, magdanakaw, mga korap, mga kriminal, at yung nagpapahirap sa Pilipino. Kaya kung ayaw ninyong minto, 
at patuloy pa rin ang karasan. Ito na ang huli ninyong Merry Christmas. You were charged with cleaning up the streets, but it, it strikes me that when you see that now, um, you think that this is wholly the wrong approach. It didn't take me very long working in drugs investigation to realise that the war on drugs just couldn't be won, because it doesn't take very much time investigating drugs to realise that the, the, the flow of drugs is never even interrupted. And since drugs were banned, they've got cheaper, they've got stronger and they've got more varied, and there is no interruption to it, to it at all. And I, I, I put people in, in prison for over a thousand years and in any city I only interrupted the flow of drugs for about two hours. What a statistic. Yeah, and there is no policing, no policing at all has any benefit at all on the, on the flow of drugs. I can say that with complete certainty. From, from my years working undercover and being privy to uh, both national and international intelligence on the topic. You know, the National Crime Agency will wheel out a bale, hail, hay bay size of cocaine and they'll say, look, what a great job we've done. And everyone looks at the, all the cocaine and says, oh, wonderful, the streets must be safe. What's your reaction to that when you see that photograph? Well, it's always less than 1% of the amount that's actually on the streets. Because I'm, I'm always sceptical of epiphany moments or moments of... But, so was it a slow, steady a grind of, you know what, this is having no effect, and then you start to see the social ills uh, or, or the social collateral damage that you're causing? Well, I was actually fairly slow on the uptake, Why? to be honest, because Why? as I said, I could see the futility. So I was always wanting to catch the bad guys, but each one, they always managed to outdo in viciousness the previous ones. But it took a long time for the penny to drop for me. I knew it was futile, I knew we weren't interrupting the flow, but I was always wanting to catch these nasty people and put them in prison. But for me, it suddenly dawned on me that the reason these gangsters, these organised crime groups, were getting more and more violent with every passing year was actually down to me. Or not just me, not specifically me. But the actions you were taking. But the actions I was taking. And I had to take a great deal of the responsibility because I was involved in the development of the tactics, the training of other, other undercover officers, the length and breadth of the country. And that the harder you try, the more you develop your expertise in police tactics the more the pushback is violence to control the populace, to stop people grassing people up and to make it more difficult for undercover police. The best defence against police informants is to terrify the community from where those communities, those informants come so from. So the grass doesn't come forward. So the, the most successful gangster is the most terrifying. It's the person that, the, when you're in, sat in that cell considering being a police informant... You're thinking, uh, in you're, your I'm mind... Think, I'm thinking, who am I least scared of? So it, it becomes a sort of urban Darwinian soup that the most terrifying, the most violent people are the most successful. And so once I'd realised that, that I was the cause of this, I realised that there's no way I can carry on doing this. Perpetuating it. Futility is bad enough, but actually causing the harm or being instrumental in the harm being caused. Seeing the evidence that I've seen, knowing the things that I do and the experiences that I've had, I, I am duty-bound to try and explain these things to people. There are vested interests within the system who do not want any of this legalised or regulated. True or false? Yes, but I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's a grand conspiracy, but you are completely correct in what you say, because it, you know, you've got the sort of alliance that one side doesn't know is in an alliance, and that is the politicians who pursue the war on drugs and the gangsters who reap the profits. Lastly... Would you focus harder on not uh, convincing politicians and political leadership, but actually engendering the debate in the arts, media, culture and in different areas? Or is your um, strategy to focus hard on, on the hierarchical aspect of this and try and push it through, through the political game? Mm. Well, I, I, actually, I actually agree with Johan that no change comes unless it comes through society. And, you know, for... for prejudice against homosexuality. It's very difficult to pinpoint a particular point in time where that, where that happened. But as you say, things shifted in journalism, it shifted in film and culture. So I, I do agree, but... What's your reservation? No, I mean, I, mean, I, I do agree. So, so at Leap UK, we produce a podcast and we, we network wherever we can with journalists and, and celebrities, all, all sorts of different people. But I think the point I like to try and make to people is that if, if you're watching this and you have become convinced or you are convinced already of the need for drug law reform, what I would point out is that this is the greatest social justice issue of our time. 
And if you do believe we need change, then you, you need to take on the responsibility of it. You need to be active and you need to be persuading other people. So that's, that social movement begins now for some people who might listen to this and decide to get involved. Follow Leap UK. Please support us, donate, follow us on social media, but also persuade everyone else that you know. This is how the social media starts. And this is, this is why at Leap UK we try and have conversations actually with everyone, everyone within the arts and journalism and everywhere. And we use the information that we, that we do with that networking when, when we approach in our advocacy towards politicians. So it's a battle with two fronts, I suppose. And, and it starts right. with the individual, and that's and what you're it's saying. Exa and, and that's that's exactly. So important that. about that is to, for people to know that this can succeed. I am gay. I'm 38. I didn't even hear the concept of gay marriage until I was 20. I recently showed one of my nephews, who's 16, the front pages of The Sun from when I was his age. He literally could not believe, even the craziest UKIP candidate would not say what used to be on the front pages of newspapers about gay people when I was that age. Extraordinary changes can happen in very short periods of time. If enough people band together and demand it, we can change this issue radically. You've both left us hopeful, and thank you so much. Oh, it's been an awesome right. discussion. We're going to hang ourselves afterwards. <laughs> it was all a cruel trick. Thank you very much for thank chasing you. the scream. All right. um, and Neil, thank you so much for going renegade first, uh, and then doing all this work to bring this into the uh, public domain and get it talked about. Awesome stuff. Thank you. Thanks, That's Ross. it from Renegade Inc. HQ this week. You can drop the team a mail, studio at renegadeinc.com or tweet us at Renegade Inc. Join us next week for more insight from those people who are thinking differently. But until then, stay curious. Yeah.